Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Hi right, guys, uh, welcome to a new semester of the Vaccination Data Seminar Series. The pandemic doesn't end, so we're having a booster session. Uh, we're super excited to kick off this new seminar, uh, semester with Oren Eni, who's the co-founder and CEO of BravenDB. It's a database system he's been working on for the last 15 years. So he's finally having him come here to talk about what he's been doing. Um, so Oren, as I said, is the co-founder of Hibernating Rhinos, which is the main company backing RavenDB's development. Uh, he's also an MVP uh, at Microsoft and has written several books about databases, in particular about RavenDB. We also, again, want to thank him for staying up late. So he's in Israel right now, and it's 11.30 p.m., so we appreciate him staying up uh, late. I will say the, world, the, the record we've had for seminar series is someone was at, I think they were in India, it was like 4.30 a.m. their time. So 11.30 is decent. We, we, it's still late, though. We appreciate you staying up with us. So as always, if anybody has any questions for Oren as he's giving this talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and, 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 and ask your question, and feel free to do this any time. We want Oren to feel like he's actually talking uh, in a room with us and not just talking to a blank screen on Zoom. So, Warren, thank you so much for staying late. The floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you very much. So, I'm here to talk about how you build a storage engine and specifically how you can implement features such as ACID and MVCC, multi-version quality control, without going crazy. Uh, this is most relevant because I had to build I have to build a storage engine from scratch because we needed it for RavenDB, which the database that we want, uh, that we created. And what I basically did, I went and gone over, basically I believe every single embedded storage engine that is there, starting from SQLite, LMDB, LevelDB, all of the other ones that came after that, there's a whole big list, and I actually wrote about that in my blog, and you can read a whole bunch of reviews on that. But it turns out that if you're looking into storage engines, the actual mechanics of what you're trying to do matters quite a lot, especially if you also want to have high performance and reliable systems. So just to give you some background, uh, this is the database that we create. Voron is the storage engine that we use. It was built completely in-house. Just to give you some details, uh, most storage engines are written in low-level uh, uh, environments, typically C, C++. Uh, RevenDB was, and Voron specifically, was written in C Sharp. And that's actually quite interesting because this is not typically taught to be a, a low-level language, but uh, it turns out that C Sharp has a lot of the facility that we need, including the ability to work with unmanaged code, the ability to uh, uh, create our own manual memory management, and structs, value up, all much of other stuff like that. And that's actually really interesting because there are certain things that you get from running on a managed runtime. For example, uh, concurrency and go data structures are significantly easier if you have a GC to back you up. A lot of edge cases, you don't really have to think about it. I can uh, uh, write a finalizer and have it clean up for me, things of this nature. Uh, just to give you some context, I started thinking about uh, what eventually became RavenDB in 2007, started actually developing in 2008, and it went to production in 2010. Uh, it's been quite a journey, and we learned quite a lot. So here is a pet peeve. Right now, there are about five to 600 different database products and there are a lot more database projects out there. I ran into this project recently, and I just saw this. Meant to perform atomic operation with reasonable durability. And that basically pressed every single hot button that I have in my head, because this is not how I think a database should be. There is no 
reasonable durability. You're either you know, durable acid or you're not. So I want to spend some time talking about why this matters. And basically it matters because if you don't have acid system, you cannot make any assumptions about the sort of data that you have in your system, which means that the level of complexity that the application developer has to face is enormous. Combine that with distributed systems where you have to uh, deal with multiple systems, latency between nodes, stuff like that, and it goes absolutely bonkers. Now, ACID, from my perspective, is the only way to go. The only problem with that is that this is stupendously hard to get there because you effectively have to fight the entire system. A lot of that, you can see here, this is an HDD, how this drive, and this is an SSD. And also the typical disk that you will run. This is where you eventually are storing your data. And the problem is that even an SSD, even NVMe drive are so slow compared to a, a main memory, compared to CPUs. So you have to orchestrate your entire system around accepting that slowness. In fact, if you are interested in high performance systems, you typically have to think very carefully about the memory hierarchy of the system. You have the L1, L2, L3 caches, main memory, and then you have disk. You, sometimes you have multiple levels of disk and with different speed for each one of them. And when you try to think about what it means in terms of how do I create an ACID system, you realize that this creates a super big problem for us to deal with. If you're talking about a really good hard disk, we're talking about 10,000 RPM, 15,000 RPM. That gives us at most two to 300 writes per second. Now, I'm talking about individual writes, not the, not the size that we're writing. And the reason this matter is because effectively you have to wait for the, uh, for the, for the platter to spin. And that matters because now I want to make a write. I want to make sure that my data is durable, but I have a limited, physically limited number of uh, uh, times per second that I can do that. And that can create horrendous problems for a database. Now, at that point, what you typically see is, oh, I don't need that. Maybe I have battery back disk, maybe I have something else, but eventually you realize that, okay, this is so slow, many people put buffering and a, a caches in front of the disk, and it's actually hard to know when you actually store the data durably to disk. It actually gets even worse when you realize that you're not the only player in town. In a typical system, and a, a server, you're usually not the only process that is running. And you're certainly not the only process that is writing to the disk. Even if you're the sole process that is running, there is also all of the background work that is happening by the operating system. For example, I write something to, a, a, to my file. Okay, I issued the right system code. Is the data on disk? No way to tell. I can call F-Sync. That would ensure that the data is on the disk. We're good, right? No, because if I increase the size of the file, that's metadata about the file that is stored in the parent directory. So I have to open the parent directory under as a read-only file and F-Sync that recursively in some cases. And that is the simplest scenario where I just want to write a single value to disk. So I have to F-Sync multiple times to get it to happen. And that is assuming a perfect system. So 
I have to think about how do I get to an asset system? How do I make sure that how do I make sure that when a transaction is committed, it is always there? Notice that I haven't even touched yet on atomic or isolated. Consistent is more at the level of the application, I'm not touching that. So the first thing that we have to realize is what is the communication protocol that we have, which is really strange. I'm talking about building a, a storage engine. A storage engine is used to build the database. Why am I considering the manner in which database talk is a key aspect of how I'm going to make things durable? And the answer is that I have two different models. This is the chat model. Begin transaction. Okay, transaction was updated, was created. Update, okay, update, okay, commit. Okay, we're done. Each one of those is a separate statement, and this is how SQL works, for example. And each one of them is a different network operation. On the other hand, I may have this model, effectively like a chat. Here is the set of commands that I'm running. I'm sending that as a single unit. It gets processed by the database, and then it sends a confirmation. Why does it matter so much that, is, that this is the first thing that I have to consider. It matters because it's an issue of when and how do I need to keep a transaction alive. If I'm running something like this, that means that I don't really have to think about a lot of issues because transaction concurrency is limited. I got a batch of operations that I need to run as a transaction, and I'm going to execute them. I may be getting additional transactions, but I don't have network latency inside my transaction. Or the other in here, between this statement and this statement, there may, may be multiple seconds. There may be an actual human who is sitting there and typing things, so it may take a minute to complete a transaction. That leads to a very different model of how we work with the database. If you're familiar with some of the uh, basic terminology in databases, uh, then we have the notion of transaction isolation. And you have, you have all of those levels with stricter, stricter and stricter guarantees about what you have and higher and higher cost. And this is almost entirely related to the communication model because you have to deal with transactions that span seconds or minutes. They're going to be interleaved, which means that you have to deal with locks and transactions that are, are very long-lived compared to the other option. There is this really nice discussion, OLTP through the looking glass, and they analyze the internal costs inside database engines, OLTP database engines, and about 40% of the cost was around locking, all of which is around supporting this scenario. So one of the first decisions that you have to make is which option do you want? Now, interestingly enough, this model for loan transactions can actually make it faster for us to do things. Why is that? Because I have all of this time from accepting the statement to write it to disk, which typically means that I have this notion of a redo log or undo log. So the issue here is I have a typically databases, if they want to be durable, they say, I'm going to write what I'm going to do to a log. And the, the question here is, what am I going to write to the log? 
what am I going to do to accept this operation or what, am I, what do I need to do to roll back this operation? <coughs> and there is this Arias model uh, about how a right ahead log uh, should look for relation to database and it is complex. On the other hand, for something like this, I can execute the entire transaction in one shot. I don't have to wait for the network. And that actually gives me a lot of really interesting optimization opportunities. So let's look at some of the options that I have. First thing, I want to make my life easier. So I'm going to use the, the uh, uh, message model, the batch model. I'm getting all of the operation and transaction in one shot. I don't have to uh, wait for the network. I'm going to have only a single writer at a time. And I'm going to allow multiple readers and ACID is an absolute requirement that I have. And if you think about it, that sounds like a really limiting environment. How can I have concourse in this case? How can I have good performance if I have a single writer? And we know that your ability is expensive. How can I make that work? So it actually turns out that a single writer has some huge implication on the complexity of your code. You don't have any granular locking. You don't have to lock on a per page or per a, a row. The code is much simpler. The, the number of concurrency, a, a, uh, the number of concurrent items that you have to juggle in your head in order to make something is vastly reduced. But how do you handle that? How do you actually uh, implement, okay, I'm writing something, but I also have readers that want to read that. How do I make that happen? And how do I implement your ability? So the first thing that I have to deal with, I have to deal with how I'm modeling the data. Let's imagine that I have a data file. Data file is some binary data, and I'm going to divide it into pages. So far, this is extremely standard database behavior. Each page, in my case, is about eight kilobytes in size, and it's used like this. Now, a key aspect here is that whenever a right transaction, or to be rather more exact, the right transaction, because I have only one of them, is going to modify. We need to modify some data. I'm not modifying the data on disk. Instead, I'm creating a copy of the data and modifying it here. What's the impact of that? I can go and modify pages, and at the same time, time, a read transaction, go and read. Because I modify a copy, it's free. I don't actually have to do any coordination between readers and writer. There is no blocking between. That's actually turned out to be a really huge decision. Now, it also means that Okay, I'm done. I can commit a transaction. But, okay, what does it mean to commit a transaction? Let's talk about this. I made some modifications. Now I want to commit a transaction and start a new transaction. This is more or less how it looks like. I have the notion of a page translation table. What does it mean? Whenever I'm looking, and you can see here, I'm here at transaction 32. And I need to open, I want to get page number one. Here is the page translation table for 32, 31, and 30. Now, no one here, no, no one here, no one here. So I get the, the page here directly from the data file. I'm getting page number four. So I'm looking at the page translation table for 32. It's not here. Here is the, but I go to the previous version, now is page 31, and here is the page 
that was modifying page 31. So I'm getting, I'm getting the last version of this page. If I would modify that, I would create another copy of that and install that in the current transaction. You can see this is what happened for page number five. I modify that in multiple transactions and now I can make it work. Now consider I currently have a running transaction for page 31, for a transaction 31. It is using this version. So it's going to see this version of page five, this version of page two, etc. This really simple concept of having a hash table of the modified pages and linking it back to the previous transactions is all I need to do to create MVCC, multi-version in concurrency control. I also get snapshot isolation effectively for free. Now, I mentioned that I'm doing that in order to get durability and, MVC and concurrency. So I touch a little bit on concurrency, but how does it help you for durability? Well, let's see how I'm rolling back a transaction. And this is basically it. Go free all of the pages in a transaction and free the table and you're done. Free the page translation table. There is no persistent modification that were made. And MVCC is effectively free in this scenario. Multiple pages exist at the same time and reader have a snapshot. The writer doesn't block for it. It's also really important to understand that at this point, I'm dealing with raw pages. There is no structure to how I'm working with this. If you look at something like Postgres, Postgres is using the chatty model with SQL. And the way that it implements things is that each page is a list of tuples with from transaction to transaction. And the entire database engine has to be aware of those. <coughs> has to know that I'm scanning through things and you have to deal with vacuuming and reordering things and how much of other work around that. In this case, the model that I'm talking about here is below the, le the level where you put meaning on the bytes. We just divided the data into pages and everything else follows from that. So, you're doing, so you're essentially doing a pen, you know, the, the pen approach or multi-versioning, right? You're, you're, just, uh, you're creating new pages. Uh, I'm not. No, I'm not. I mean, I, 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 so initially I did. So okay. if you're familiar with how LMDB works, this is how it works. It always does copy and write, but the problem in this case is that every time that you do that, you have to copy the whole, uh, 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 you have to copy uh, upward. Yes. So if I'm looking right now, let's say that I have a typical uh, B tree. You have the root, you have page one, page three, page four. And now I want to make a modification on page four. So I have page, uh, uh, page eight, which is a copy of page four. But in order for it, but I have to also have the page three, page one and the root. So I actually have to make four copies here in order to deal with this modification because effectively I'm working with immutable data. Now, LMDB deals with that in a really a, a nice manner because it keeps track of a free list and will reuse pages. But as the data size grows, you still have a, a, a write amplification. And that's not something that I wanted to do. So instead, what I'm going to have, this is the data on disk. And now I have this page translation table 
that point to Samaloc data. And that's it. And obviously that doesn't really work that well over time because, well, you have bigger and bigger lists and the more time uh, goes by, you have to scan back uh, 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 through all of the pending transaction. That's horrible. So let's talk about how I'm actually going to commit. So there are two ways to commit a transaction. First of all, I need to make all of the changes that happen in that transaction public to any new transactions that I have. And the way that I'm doing that, I'm just publishing the current base transaction table. I'm installing that as the new, uh, uh, the new value for all future transactions. Now, this still doesn't work that well because now I have to deal with how to ensure durability and how do I uh, cut down the chain that would go over time. If I have 100,000 transactions, I would have a chain that I have to scan through 100,000 page translation tables. So as I mentioned, this IO is really, really slow. And we never in pretty much any other system, we are never writing to the disk directly. And there is quite a lot of details in these two links that shows how complex it is to actually write durably to the disk. And in 2018 or so, there was the, something called Epstein Gate, where it turns out that Postgres, MySQL, Mongo, and a bunch of other databases as well were using Epstein wrong on Linux. And the underlying issue was that Fsync can fail. And if Fsync can fail, then the state of the data, what's in memory, what's on disk, is effectively undetermined. About the only thing that you could safely do at this point is crash the database and run recovery from scratch. And what Postgres did was it would retry the Fsync and it would get an F-Sync, it would fail, then it would at some later point do an F-Sync again, it would work, but some data that was supposed to go to disk never reached disk, and then you ended up with data corruption. It was a big kerfuffle in the database uh, community at the time. So let's talk about how I can get to durable system. So writing to the disk is really slow. It's even worse than that. Writing to disk on random location is even slower. So I have to do something about that. Now, I cannot assume that a write to the disk will be atomic, even if I'm writing just a single page. If I'm writing four kilobytes, the underlying disk may be working in sector of 5, 12 bytes. And they don't necessarily have to be atomic. For that matter, I don't even know that a sectoroid is atomic. So we cannot assume basically anything. And we handle all sorts of really, really nasty errors. I wrote to the disk successfully, then I closed the file and I failed to close the file. So as I mentioned, writing the disk is hard. Don't try to do that. So the lack, the lucky thing from our perspective is that we're working in pages, which means that we have very clear model of what changed. In fact, if you think about it, this thing here, the page translation table, this is the list of pages that were modifying this transaction. So what can I do with that? I could just do this. Use the writer head log. And the transaction commit is basically, let's take all of the modified files, mo mo sorry, modified pages, and write them to the log. On startup, we go to this log, read all of the modified pages from the file, write them to the data file, and then you're done. And this is about as simple as you can get in terms of programming models. You have a transaction, it modifies some pages, commit, write the modified versions of the pages to disk. On startup, you just write them and you're done. Now, 
there are some really important aspects that you have to take into account. First of all, there are many models to ensuring the, that the data is actually written to the, to the uh, log properly. You can call right, uh, call to the right system call and eventually call fsync on the log file. But again, that leads to interesting complexities. What I prefer to do is to use this model. This uses direct IO and including the uh, data sync flag. And the idea is that what this forces the operating system to do is to send you to send a command directly to the disk with the FUA force unit access flag turned on, which basically tells to the disk, I want you to write it to persistent medium. Don't come back to me until this is done. Now this is important because what does FSync do? FSync effectively flash all of the buffers for a particular file. Now, in many cases, this is implemented as let's flash everything for this particular disk. There was a, a famous case in 2008 where Firefox used SQLite and they used it to store some state in a page, which meant that they were running about 30 transactions per second. And SQLite calls to FSync. And if you were running Firefox in Linux and trying to do something like compile some code, which caused a lot of IO, it would cause a lot of FSync, would effectively freeze the system because it would basically wait for IO and stop everything else. If you're using direct IO, in this case, you're effectively skipping the let's put it on the cache and then flush the cache. You're effectively saying, go directly there. Don't wait in line and then push forward. Uh, there are certain limitations to this. You have to have aligned memory and a bunch of other stuff like that. But it turns out that because you're working with pages, which are naturally aligned, then this is not an onerous requirement this is not an also requirement for a database. This is how you really think about it. Other consideration that you have to take into account is that don't try to grow the file dynamically. Pre-allocate the file to some reasonable size. We typically use 256 megabyte because that makes a lot of sense for our scenarios. And basically you allocate the, you pre-allocate the file, uh, the file, F-sync the entire, the entire uh, uh, parent directories, and then you can make the effectively direct calls uh, to that without worrying about anything else. That would be a single disk write that you have to work with. So that's also nice. You pre-allocate the file. You're creating sequential I.O., which is insanely optimized. This is actually really funny if you think about that. Sequential writes are fast on hard disks, because you're effectively writing in a sequence. This is not how SSD works. But because all of the optimal systems were optimized to run on hard disk and were writing in sequential manners, there was a huge pressure on SSDs to optimize sequential writes. So they do. So we are still carrying on this notion of sequential writes being the fastest way to do that. Now, we have to take into account that the write may be partial. So when we write to the journal file, we do that with a checksum. Ideally, cryptographically strong checksum. Now, we consider the transaction to be committed if the checksum is valid, because now we have a really good indication that what we wrote and the expected value are the same. In other words, when we read the transaction log, we say, okay, here is a transaction. Let's get it checksum. Let's get its size. Read it from the disk. 
check that the checksum is valid. If so, this is a committed transaction, we are going to apply that to the data file. And we have a single write, which would be important in a moment. And this forces to wait until the disk comes back, which is super important from our perspective. Because once this came back from the disk, we know that this has been saved durably. Now, let's talk about this again. We, a transaction that being written is a set of modified pages. But because of MVCC, we also have the old pages. Now, an important observation is that in many cases, we don't modify the whole page. So we can do a diff and write only the modified bytes. On top of that, we can compress the data. And in many cases, you can uh, especially consider the fact that, oh, I'm writing a lot of very similar records. They would compress really well. That can uh, give us significant savings in terms of how much IO we run. Now, this actually turned out to be really critically important. Why is that? Because of the way that it works. IO is expensive, especially we're now in the uh, uh, age of the cloud, where disk, uh, disk speed is horrendously limited. You can go and take a off-the-shelf NVMe drive, and you should be able to get to 100, 200,000 IOPS. Easy. You go to the cloud, you get 100 IOPS. The, uh, this is basically like taking your database and killing it. Not even killing it softly, just killing it. So uh, the reduction in the uh, amount of IO that you write is absolutely worth it. And, and to pay the, the compression and difference. And finally, there is an interesting observation here. We have an issue here of a single writer and slow IO. But I don't actually, have, and this is a really nice trick, I don't have to wait for the disk to complete the operation. I can do something called async commit and still maintain all of the transaction guarantees. How do I do that? I'm starting the commit process, which basically means running the diff, running the compression and writing to the disk. And I'm doing that in a background thread. At the same time, I'm already starting to process the next transaction. Now, it is possible that the ASCII commit would fail. If it fails, I just abort the current transaction, abort the previous transaction because, hey, it wasn't written to this, it failed, and I'm done. On the other end, in the common case where the transaction is successful, and remember, at this point, we are transaction successful means that we were able to actually write it to the disk. And being unable to write to the disk is a fairly catastrophic scenario. And we can parallelize the IO cost of writing to the disk with already doing the in-memory processing for the next transaction. So this is uh, basically what it looks like. One option is to get the write log, execute the transaction, and commit. Get the write log, execute the transaction, commit. This is horrible. At best, because uh, what happens is that you can execute one transaction per how many IOPS you get from the system. And that's not a lot. On the other hand, look at what we have here. We are doing something really interesting. We're doing transaction merging. Each one of those commands, we, uh, we, if each one of those is a set of commands that run as an atomic transaction. I have something that listens to the network, read the transaction and all of its command from the network, and then it throws it into a queue. And then I have a backup thread that take the right clock, Take the right look and read from the queue. 
and execute this command in the same transaction. So multiple of them happen one after the other in the same storage transaction. And now I'm waiting for the previous transaction to complete. And after I successfully completed the previous transaction, I'm starting the async process of the, of the current transaction and going back right here to continue pulling items from the disk, from the, from the queue. Now, it's interesting because we are still maintaining all of the usual guarantees. We still have an actual atomic transactions. Each one of them is running in atomic transactions, but we don't guarantee the order between transactions. So we are free to execute them as we wish. We can actually try to be smart about it and try to look into the commands inside the transaction, execute them in some optimal order. In practice, I found that this is too complex, doesn't give a, a good benefits, but the difference between this version and this version is amazing. Just to give you some a, a concept, uh, once the, the first time that we implemented that, that was the difference. And currently, RevenueDB is able to process something in the order of 150 to 200,000 individual writes per second based on these concepts. Now, so far, most of what I've talked about is, okay, I have the personal station table, copy on write, MVCC, and write into the log. But what about updating the data file? How does that work? So the whole idea is that we have this notion of copy on write. And a transaction is going to run. It's going to have a snapshot of the database. Eventually, all of the current transactions have proceeded to the point that no one is going to look at the modified pages that we have in memory. So no one is going to look at the modified pages on the disk because all of them are going to look at the modified pages in memory. That means that I can now go and update those pages on the data file because there's no read transaction that can observe them. That also leads to another interesting detail. We are now, we now have three separate steps for a transaction for the IO that we run. We have the commit portion where we write the modified pages to the journal. This is how we decide the transaction is committed or not. Then we have, once all of the retransactions have proceeded beyond that point in time, we can write those details to the data file. Now, once we write them to the data file, we can delete them from memory. But we don't, but write it to the data file doesn't write them to the disk. It writes them to the in-memory buffer for the operating system, to the, to the page cache. And there is a background process that would write them to the disk. That's still, and that's actually something that we want because that gives the operating system the, a chance to do IO coalescing. Instead of having individual writes to the, to the file, it can do that in a big bulk. Eventually, I'm going to call FSync. And when I'm called FSync, then I can actually go and clear the log. The typical way that I'm doing that is that I'm calling FSync every time that I'm switching log files. And why does it matter? It matters because if a log file is 256 megabyte, then I can push a lot of transaction before I have to call FSync which means that the open system had the chance to probably write quite a lot of those buffers to disk, and I'm not paying a lot of cost on the FSIC. 
So we are back on IO is a huge issue. And the cloud make this extremely painful. This is especially the case because many cloud systems are actually using a, a burstable IO. So for example, the GP2, GP3 disk on AWS would give you up to 3000 IOPS for some duration. And they would basically drop to effectively nothing. Uh, on Azure, you have the standard disk, which are really high latency and store IOPS, and that can be a killer. So as much as possible, we want to have predictable IO behavior and want to push as much of the IOPS as we can get outside of the uh, uh, critical path for the system. So a high level question, like for your RavenDB customers, which one of them are running on provision IO versus like the, the GPT or whatever the, 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 the first of all one from, from Amazon? Uh, if you're running on the, uh, we have RevitB as a DB as a service, mm -hmm. and you basically choose your own system. Basically, when you select the, basically when you, when you select what edition you want, you have multiple options to go through. Let me see if I can show it. I, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So one of the options is, and let's go to. So one of those options is here, which affect the number of calls, the memory that you have, etc. And the other option is the size of the disk and the uh, IOPS that you have. And this is effectively, this is reflecting exactly the system that you have for on the cloud, because the, um, this is a, IO1, IO1 or IO2 disk in AWS with 5,000 IOPS. This would be GP3 or GP2, whatever, with however many IOPS you get, uh, you get for that. And yeah. I have a question, like what percentage of your customers that are running on the cloud are using provision IOPS versus not? A 40 plus percent would run on provision IOPS, I would say. Okay. Um, a lot of that is also, so that's actually interesting because I always matter a lot, but only after you, uh, you're you running with a work set beyond the uh, memory capacity. And it actually turns out that in some cases, it's cheaper to get a bigger machine with bigger, uh, uh, big, bigger memory than to get better disk. Mm. Um, it's also funny, you can, you can literally get a machine with more RAM than, uh, uh, than the maximum size of this you can get in, uh, in the cloud. The maximum RAM you can get is 24 terabyte, the maximum this you can get is 16 terabyte. Uh, going back to the uh, IO patterns, something that uh, uh, we run into quite painfully is that even though you can optimize for the steady state. You have to take into account all sorts of annoying edge cases. For example, we had a customer that says, what they care about the most was running as quickly as possible with a, a low latency. So they had a really big machine, they had good disks, and uh, uh, they defined their journal size to be very high, which meant that we would F-sync very rarely. Now, the way that they did that, they actually run on two separate disks. They have one disk, which was the journal disk, which was very, very fast. And then they have the HHD, HHD, which was a lot bigger, but much, much slower. Now, that meant that uh, effectively the critical part was going to a fast disk and in the background, the OS would speed the data to here, basically edit leisure. That worked great until they ran into a case where they did 
a big bulk of data import and then restarted the database server. What actually happened was that they uh, ran out of this space and they had to shut down to increase the uh, this space for this for the system. And the system would not start. The database would not start. Typical that typical database startup times is measured in 30 seconds or so on a large database that's very busy. But in this case, you saw that there is zero uh, uh, zero CPU. Zero, almost zero uh, IO, negligible memory, but the system was basically not proceeding anymore. And what turned out was that they had large journal files and we use compression on the data. So we start reading from the journal file and we have to do random reads and random writes into the data file to run the recovery. And this is unfortunately a sequential process. So basically uh, run into worst case scenario for that, uh, 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 for that setup. Okay, read here, read here, read here, and wait for it to happen. Read here, wait for that to happen, etc. So that was an incredibly painful scenario for us. We actually had to change things around to make sure that uh, we are handling that edge case properly. But um, basically, storage engine is all about how you can think about this is slow. How do I avoid paying the price for that? And what kind of optimal access pattern I have around building this? Notice that everything that I said so far doesn't touch on how you read or write from, uh, from the disk. Uh, you can use uh, your own pager to pull data from the disk and manage that, but eventually everything has to go to the disk and, uh, and be persistent. And even in case you have to make the distinction between written to the data file and actually sync to the data file as two separate steps. And I added some resources. A lot of those is about the details, about some of the details of uh, Voron and all bunch of details about how to build a database. This is a book that I'm uh, still writing on that that cover all of those in detail, including uh, executable code in C uh, from scratch. And if you want to, this is the source code for Voron that you can go over with. That's it, any questions? So I, I will clap on behalf of everyone else. Uh, if there's any questions, if you have questions for Oren, please unmute yourself and fire away. I like to ask a question. This is Steven. And um, how do you test any of those mechanisms that you speak of earlier? Um, how do you test them besides just writing very brutal integration tests? Writing brutal integration tests? Uh... I, I, let me put it this way. Uh, I have a, a, I have a, a worn out multiple NVMe drives doing a, a, a integration test. Uh, more to the point, there are a couple of a, a good tools that you can use. There is Alice and there is a Bob. Uh, Alice uh, is a tool that analyzes the system call that you use and then it reorders them and see if the system still makes sense after, uh, after that. Bob is a... Bob is, uh, is binary... Um, doesn't remember. There is a, this is meant to, uh, uh, to test file system implementation because it works on the block device. Yeah. A block reordering something. Doesn't remember the don't remember the uh, the of that. So those are the uh, primary tools that you would use to do that. There is a lot of just 
reading the documentation and understanding what sort of guarantees you can have, and then going and reading other database engines and seeing what they're doing and what they can rely on. Uh, if something isn't 20 years old, I don't want to touch that API, uh, mostly because you get into interesting edge cases. For example, there is a hole punch in API and it works in ext4 and in uh, ptrfs but uh, doesn't necessarily work on a uh, sift uh, cfs and all sort of other things like that so uh you want to be really conservative about what sort of api interactions you run in uh, something that we did we had a an environment where we could do a programmatic a power interrupts on a physical machine. And we ran hundreds of cycles of that in order to test that the, uh, this works. You can sort of do stuff like that on virtual machines and about midways and things like that. But we wanted to verify on physical hardware with all of the uh, things that are involved. Uh, some things that I haven't mentioned, which is important, everything that they talked about assumes that the disk will is reliable. And that comes in two fashions. One, that if you send a write to disk with force unit access, that write is actually going to be durable and power cycle. Second, that what you wrote and what you read are the same, which is not true. This is interesting uh, observation, but in, uh, in general, for every five petabyte or so of writes that you, uh, you write, you will see some form of wrong data. The way that, uh, everything that I talk about at this point was about at the, raw page layer, uh, but uh, so we doesn't care what, what data you actually have, but uh, we actually don't believe the disk at all. And we utilize uh, checksums heavily in order to validate the data is consistent. So when we write in to the writer head log, then the uh, transaction is checksum. And we also have checksum on each individual page that validate that uh, that page data is consistent. Now, in some cases, uh, there are persistent data structures that would duplicate important data. For example, the master file table on NTFS is stored in multiple locations on the disk. We have decided not to do that for uh, uh, RavenDB and for Voron in general. What we have done instead is detect that there is an error and uh, raise that to the user. The reason this is the case is because in many cases, um, in many cases, an error at this level is catastrophic because you have a hardware issue. And at that point, the reaction is, okay, I'm working with effectively malicious data. I don't know if I can recover from that, or even if I can recover from an error here, there is probably going to be an error somewhere else uh, uh, quite quickly. And another issue is that, uh, again, thinking about the cloud, if you have an issue in the cloud, you can typically, AWS systems, are uh, uh, no, not AWS, uh, EBS, uh, are redundant and supposed to be protected on that on a lower level than the disk interface that we see. In many production systems, you would run on RAID 0, RAID 1 at least, uh, so RAID 1 or RAID 5 uh, at least, so you have that level of redundancy. You don't need to add that at the database level as well. Thank you. I have one more question, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll take it. So you mentioned in the beginning that you love writing Voron and RavenDB and C-sharp. Um, 
Yeah, it, it is rare, right? You're probably, Ray D's probably the most well known C sharp DJ that I, that I, at least I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. And there's a bunch of other small hobby ones, but you guys are certainly the biggest. Is there anything about C sharp that you don't like that, like, you know, like, I'm not saying you're going to go switch to C++, but like, is there something like C sharp like, that really bothers you? Like, man, this is, this is a pain having to do this in, in this environment. The, Yes and no. So the primary reason is that it is incredibly easy to get into a, a, into code parts that allocate and allocate heavy. A, one of the things that um, we did in RevDB in general was to take a lot of ownership on memory allocation, we use uh, the ARENA model, uh, do a lot of own uh, memory management. And that gave us about 10 times speed boost compared to previous version, where we utilize a lot of managed memory. At the same time, it's incredibly easy to uh, create code that allocates. And for a long time, the base class library API were basically forcing you to allocate. And we had to do a lot of workarounds around that. There's been tremendous improvement around that. And if I was writing Vol from scratch today, I would probably have the ability to do almost no allocation at all in the common case. Uh, allocations are bad because the impact performance and all of the usual things around that. Uh, I'm writing uh, the, this thing, the book I'm writing, I wrote it in C, and I spent an inordinate amount of time dealing with edge cases, memory management, recovery of error, those sort of things. And it is amazing how trivial a lot of those issues become when you don't have to, oh, an error here would leak memory, so I have to write. 10 times more code just to recover from that. Uh, I mentioned concurrent data structures, and I think this is a really, really important uh, aspect. Having a, something like a concurrent dictionary in C Sharp is just something that I can reach and use trivially. In something like a, a C, C, Rust, Zig, those sort of languages, a concurrent data structure basically does not exist. Or if it exists, this is hazard pointers or epoch base, and the level of complexity is just so much higher and more complex. Uh, a really good example, if I want to implement a skip list in C Sharp, which is a very common uh, data structure for mem tables, it's easy, it's natural. I don't have to really think about how to do that. In C++, okay, concurrent skip list and managing the uh, memory to free is non-trivial in the extreme. 